following is a darshan given by His Holiness Jaya Pataka Swami Maharaj on October 16, 1982 at New Panihati Dam in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. The class was entitled, Beginning Bhakti Yoga Takes the Karma Out of Living. Krishna Mahamantra is given in the Kali Santana Upanishad. Kali Santana Upanishad. So there, Iti Sodasakam Nam Nam, these sixteen names mentioned. Kali Kalamash. Kalamash means all the contamination of Kali, of this age of quarrels. Nashanam are destroyed. All this contamination is destroyed. This is confirmed by all the different Vedas. So this 16 word mantra was brought especially by Narada Muni from the spiritual world for purifying the people of the Kali Yuga. In the Nada Pancharatrik it mentions that all the Vedic mantras have been combined into eight words. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So in some places it mentions the first eight and then otherwise it mentions all the 16. So, and this chanting is so powerful that even a person himself is not purified, they can chant this even without initiation. One can chant Hare Krishna and it will still uplift them to a certain point. Then after a, a certain point of advancing, then one takes the guidance of spiritual mass and learns how to avoid offenses and is able to further advance. Then we also have uh, secret mantras seven which we give. And these mantras are contain uh, all the uh, other Vishnu mantras are contained in these last two of these mantras. But one can't chant those mantras until one is initially purified by chanting Hare Krishna for some time. The like Hare Krishna is so powerful even if you're not pure you can still chant it and get benefit. These mantras are, require some purity to be able to chant without offense. Hare Krishna is a special facility given in this age that one can chant without offense. That's why many of the yogis in Patanjali system give the Shiva mantras because Shiva doesn't take offense very easily but doesn't actually take one, it takes one out of material attachment but doesn't actually take one into the spiritual transcendental realization. Unless it's, again, chanted uh, under guidance of bona fide program. So the point is, you can chant Hare Krishna, you may say, well, they're chanting out loud, or it's too, and if we had made it a secret mantra, chant Hare Krishna is the secret, then maybe it would have had more appeal. We could have sold it or something. But the point is that because this chanting was actually given like that and it was promoted always uh, in an open way, the thing is that just the chanting itself to actually go up, up into to the higher realms of the chanting, one has to be chanting more and more and that also has to be under expert guidance. There are so many different stages that I was mentioning to him that one achieves as you're chanting. And how one goes from one stage to the next, what are the various uh, symptoms as a person is experiencing different realizations, this has to be guided. It's not that uh, one can uh, do it without any uh, spiritual master, without any guidance. So it's a whole separate line, completely different from the system of Patanjali which is basically a mechanical system. If you can control the airs in the body, if you can fix your mind for that moment, then you can, uh, you can achieve certain cities or mystic powers. The mechanical system. 
that this system is goes beyond the uh, mechanical system. It's actually the activity which is on the spiritual platform. When you are self-realized, you will be chanting Hare Krishna. Spontaneous. Spontaneously. And when you are chanting Hare Krishna then, you will realize that that vibration and Krishna are not different. Now, in that we're saying the conditioned state, a person is chanting Hare Krishna, they, and first they may just think, well, it's just some sound, it's just some names, it's just some vibration, it's just, you know, I'm just saying something, words. And as they continue chanting, then they start getting more and more purified. They're able to realize that by chanting, I'm getting some peace. Sometimes they fall asleep after the first, the first stage. Then they uh, go beyond that. And then they start getting some energy. Then they start to realize that they're getting some type of spiritual shelter. And then finally, as they, they advance, they start developing a taste for chanting and so on. And then ultimately they see that the chanting is actually alive. That this vibration is not different from Krishna. That the sound Krishna is as alive as Krishna is alive. It's a spiritual... Uh, reality, you see. And so, actually, you're correct in one sense that a person doesn't realize the full potency of the chanting or the full uh, ecstasy of self-realization until you're completely realized. But the difference in other practices of yoga is until you realize yourself, you're on the material platform. And when you realize yourself, then you're on the spiritual platform. But because devotional service is the begin, it's the same either in conditional life, when you're beginning as a neophyte, or in the perfected states, the practice is the same. The difference is that in the beginning stages you do it according to rules and regulations because it's not spontaneous. But those rules and regulations correspond almost identically with what happens when the soul spontaneously is on the spiritual platform. So one is already acting as a pure soul acts by following various rules, regulations, and what's called sadhana, or practice. And then as one advances, one becomes closer and closer from, in the beginning, maybe it's 12% spiritually conscious and 87% materially conscious. And then 25, 75, 50, 50, 75, then 25, 75. Then it's 99% spiritually conscious, 1% material. And then finally, you realize the self. Before you realize the self, far before that, already you're actually free from karma. And you already feel complete relief. At that point, you're completely convinced that you're not the body. And you're already habitually, you don't even act. Intellectually. It's more than intellectually. Although it's not the same as seeing the self face to face and seeing God, but it's more than just an intellectual. Because intellectually, you can change your mind. So this is a, this is a, this is a realization. It's actual realization, but it's a realization on a. Uh, it's a it's a form of realization. The living reality of your experience. It's a partial realization. It's a partial realization. Just like take it that uh, you're blind, so you can't see the fire. But someone explains to you that there's fire in front of you, and they tell you hold your hands out. You feel the heat from the fire, you can feel the heat, the radiation. So this is the nature. Fire is uh, very light and it's giving off the heat. You can already feel the heat. And if you put your hand too close to the fire, you'll get burnt. But you can't see. Your eyes are blind. Say. But you have the realization. It's not a question of just intellectual, you see. And in the so in this in the same type of way, even though you may not have come to that purity to see Krishna and to see your own spiritual self. But already you become above the laws of karma. You completely feel complete relief from the reactions and your consciousness doesn't get degraded. The meditation maintains throughout the whole day and night and you become more and more just, just as the person as you're getting closer to the fire, you're, getting, you're experiencing the heat. You're experiencing reciprocation with Krishna. You're experiencing that you're not the body in so many ways. And then finally you actually see yourself. And uh, you see the Supreme Self. And that's how Maharishi is supposed to get enlightened. Who? Maharishi Mahashoni, through devotion to his guru, forming action according to his whims. 
confused and enlightened, Maharishi was therefore performing action according to... Every, every form of yoga, even Patanjali's yoga, also has this part of bhakti with it. You see, every yoga includes bhakti to some extent or other. You can never separate bhakti. There will always be devotion to guru. In some forms there will be, there'll be various types of devotion. Bhakti is a part of every yoga. But what most of them think is that they do the devotion and then when they achieve their object of meditation, at that point they give up the devotion because in the, in the impersonal idea they become one with the object of their meditation. So then devotion no longer has a place. They never understand the devotees that are doing pure bhakti. They're not relying on any other form of meditation. They're just doing pure bhakti. And by doing the pure bhakti yoga, they never lose their individuality. And by pure bhakti, they actually advance immediately to the transcendental platform. Isn't that where <coughs> you lose your individuality? How? I don't, that's why I don't, I don't understand your idea about not merging with the goal. Um, here, give me this Bhagavatam, the first uh, volume is two. Uh, my understanding is realizing the self, it's infinite, unbounded, non-changing, eternal. That is the same as, you know, pure being, spirit. Uh, the self is not infinite. In the Bhagavad Gita, it never says the self is infinite. It says it's non-changing. It says it's eternal. It says it's indivisible. It says it's, inv- it's ever-existing. It says it can't be cut, dried, burned, destroyed in any way. But at the same time, it's also infinitesimal. The absolute truth is realized in three different forms. This is a, a picture of our Vedic cosmology. This little section here is the material universes. Each one of these little dots is a universe, like a bubble. This is a blow up here of one of the universes with uh, the Brahma on the lotus and Prabhupada Dakshai Vishnu. Inside the universe is dark except for the sun which illuminates and the other fire planet. So, we are all within this material unit. When we get out of the universe and we come into this uh, area here, total material energy, that's called the Pradhana Mahatattva, that's known as Nirvana, the Buddhist realization. Mm-hmm. Where one dismantles, by that, to get out of the universe, you have to dismantle intelligence, you have to dismantle everything. And there's just the soul with a thin covering of material nature. And when you get out here, then one goes beyond that, and still because of that thin cover of false ego, one is not able to see the self. So, the Buddhists think that they've annihilated themselves. They think that they become void. But the Patanjali yoga system goes beyond that, and one crosses over the virocha, or the boundary of the material world, and goes into the spiritual light. Now, there are millions and unlimited number of spirit souls which are comprising the light which is coming from spiritual planets. And the system of realization, actually Patanjali taught ultimately Paramatma realization, but I think it became... The Kaivani. Yeah, it became distorted. So anyway, so then one comes out of the material world and realizes the spiritual light. Now at that time, because when you're one ray of light amongst so many unlimited rays of light, ocean of light, then you naturally can identify yourself with the whole ocean if you want to. But actually, it's just like if you put one drop in the ocean, it doesn't actually become the whole ocean. The ocean was there before the drop was there, and if the drop leaves, the ocean is still there. But when you get one drop in the ocean, if you want to, you can think, I'm the whole ocean. No one's stopping you. So that's what happens with the impersonal yogis. They see themselves and they see the unlined other, all the other, on that level of consciousness, there are all the other selves also illuminated fully. 
And so it, it just becomes like an ocean of spiritual illumination. And then they identify that now, then they see themselves going into the ocean. And they think, now, I am, you know, one with the ocean. But actually, they're not one. They're still one individual soul. Just now, they're just taking up a, a part as like one spiritual atom amongst all the others. Mm-hmm. You see, so the devotional yogis, they don't want that. The bhakti yogis, they consider that that type of negation of one individuality, you, you don't you actually don't destroy yourself, it's just that you're not cognizant anymore of the difference between you and anyone else. Mm-hmm. You're just taking up an impersonal, non-active type of position. That's what they mean when they say this. One sees yourself in all beings, the verse in the Gita about how one sees the same self in the cow and the dog. And no, that's why you see that every uh, that every self is equal. Right, that's when you merge with all the race, right? No, but uh, even that, <coughs> not that you have to merge. You see that those who have the the Brahman realization, they can also see that their self, and they can see the self is existent in all the other of the entities. The Bhakti Yogi can also see the same thing. You see, there's three levels. It's called Brahmati, Paramatmati, Bhagavaniti. The Paramatma realization is realizing, even in this world, if you realize the... Uh, Kiro Dakshai Vishnu, the form of Vishnu in the heart, that's called Paramatma realization. That actually, the system of uh, Astanga Yoga was meant for realizing the Paramatma. The Eightfold Mystic Yoga system is actually meant to realize the Paramatma in the heart. Sometimes the yogi mistakes that he is the Paramatma. That's another mistake. Actually, so how do you prevent that? Merging. How do you maintain an individuality while realizing yourself as, like you said, the one? Yes, now that, that, that's what I'm explaining. The only way you can maintain your individuality, once you come here, you have to have a direction. If you don't have a direction, you're going to emerge. You have to be headed for the spiritual planets, where the light is coming from. And the spiritual planets, there the original forms of God are existing. And in the spiritual planets, there are spiritual activities. So just as Krishna has got his spiritual form, which is beyond the three modes, never grows old, it's eternal. Sat chit ananda vigraha. Sat chit ananda. You must have heard that. Mm-hmm. Eternal, eternity, sat chit knowledge, ananda, bliss. So Krishna's form is known as the form of bliss, or sat chit ananda. So he lives on the spiritual planet called Golok Vrindavan. There's the supreme spiritual planet. And then there are also many other planets with different forms of Narayana, like Varaha, Nishingha, Kurma, Matya, and many other forms of Godhead, Vasudev, etc. They're all living, and these, they each have their own planet. There's unlimited, just as there's so many planets in the material universe, there are many, many more times spiritual planets. And in between those planets, there all is the Brahma Jyoti, the spirit, the light. So, at Bhakti Yoga, Yogi has already develop his spiritual form. When you're doing this other form of mystic meditation, when you realize yourself, you just realize yourself as the spark of light. Because they haven't rendered devotional service, they haven't developed the spiritual form. But the spiritual form, as mentioned here, there's four types of liberation. The other type, merging, wasn't even mentioned. I can show you another sloka where it mentions the other type, the fifth type of liberation. The four Kumaras had realized this impersonal Rama Jyoti. And they were in that liberation. But then when they, what, they just happened to wander, they're, they're going wandering in the light and somehow they decided to go to one of the planets. So when they went to one of the planets, they were stopped at the gate. And there was a, there was a, that's a whole other thing that happened. So anyway, when they actually saw the form of Narayana, they offered him respect and bowed down. But when they were smelling the scent of uh, some of the sacred flowers offered to his feet, they started to feel transcendental ecstasies. Oh, they were already emerged in terms of their realization. They were already uh, realizing the happiness of the uh, impersonal realization. But they experienced complete ecstasy quivering and everything. And so at that point, they could understand that their realization was uh, inferior to what they were experiencing when they could actually see the form of Krishna as Narayana. And then, from that point, they became converted to bhakti yogis. That's what, that's what I think Marishi's steps are. 
reach the soft rose and then after that develop. But the, the, difference, the, the problem is that it's very hard to reach self-realization in this age, to actually achieve self-realization in this age by this process that you're talking about is next to impossible. Because this very disturbed age, actually one has to be completely peaceful, and as you said, I mean, they can levitate this, but levitation is not even, I mean, you have to really get as a complete samadhi continuously for a long, long time before you can actually achieve that type of liberation. And in this age, it's very disturbing. So it's, it's, it's practically not very possible. And our minds are very disturbed. This, this system was offered to Arjuna, and he said, it's easier for me to control a hurricane than trying to control my mind. That I, I, can't, I can't practice that, there's no, no other system. And then he proceeded to present the system of bhakti. Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. So the point is that Bhakti Yogi, they're already knowing the activities which are being performed in the spiritual world. And so as they're serving in this world, they're already developing their spiritual body. When Narada Muni died, he was talking about Narada Muni who can travel all over the universes. So when Narada Muni suffered what we call death, so it was like a strike of lightning. Simultaneously, he immediately left his material body and his spiritual body, he realized his spiritual form. And with that form, he was able to go to the material universes, to the spiritual universe, everywhere. So what what about during life, when we have the material body, and we're developing um, this, this spiritual form? Yeah. Is, is, is there any experience of, of that along with... Um, so while you're developing your spiritual yeah. form, yeah. then there's... That you, as you, as, as I mentioned, there's these different stages. So you're experiencing already transcendental ecstasy. In the material life, there's a difference between, you're seeing everything through your mind. But these ecstasies are beyond the mind. So when you're experiencing the ecstasies, it's right from the spiritual platform, your mind and intelligence are completely, at that point, almost inactive. I mean, they don't, it's, just, it's beyond them, you see. They just become very peaceful at that moment. But actually, it's a whole other ecstasy which is completely transcendental to the mind, to the body. But it affects the mind and body also by, in, a, in a very positive way, like quivering in the body and the mind becomes very peaceful and satisfied. And then one experiences an intense ecstasy which is completely indescribable. It's completely in Describable and simultaneously to understand these literatures, these truths, gradually one has to be freed from all doubts and has to be completely situated in the truth. So to understand spiritual knowledge is not something that's theoretical. It's not like you can just memorize these things and then you, you're on a spiritual platform. But it's something that by performing devotional service, you build up a type of spiritual credit called Sukriti. And the more that you build up the spiritual assets, the more you're able to comprehend the spiritual truths. And these become realized knowledge. They become actually fixed. Where, just like this, uh, like Socrates, what, wasn't it, our, Socrates was, uh, they were, they, uh, were assassinated. And then he said, you know, that I'm not this body. They can't let them try to, like they took poison, hemlock, and then, he had already achieved. Now, he may not have seen the self, he may have seen the self. At that point, it was irrelevant, because he was completely already fixed in Brahma Gyan, that he was not the body. So that, that firm uh, uh, understanding is not different from the actual realization. It's just a, a different stage. It's like a green mango or a green banana. They ship all the green bananas from Costa Rica. By the time they get here, they're ripe. It's already a banana. It just takes a couple of weeks and it becomes ripe. So like that, when you're already on the realization, you're already, the form is there. It's just a question of whether it's green or ripe. If you just keep it there long enough, it turns ripe. So even before it's fully ripened, you already have a lot of experiences. It's not just like you're going on and on and there's no reciprocation. At every stage you're experiencing so many things. You come completely satisfied. 
and that all type of anxieties and lamentations go away, which is the biggest obstacle in spiritual life. Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma. So, what you achieve when you get liberation of realizing the self, you immediately get that just by rendering pure devotional service. Immediately, you become freed from lamentation and fear and anger, all these things. Immediately, you become fixed in uh, self-satisfaction. My question on that is, how can you achieve pure devotional service without self-realization? How can you... Um, if Marisha would call it mood-making. It's not mood-making because the whole system of sadhana bhakti is framed in this way that just like What's the difference between a self-realized soul? If you're saying, what's the difference between an embodied being and a being who doesn't have a body? Right. So the difference is that you have to eat, otherwise you can't survive. Right. Your spiritual form doesn't have to eat. It may eat or not eat. That's another thing. But the point is, it doesn't it's ever existing? It. We have to sleep. Right. We have these basic other physical necessities of there. We have action, which all every action we're doing is producing karma. So in the practice of sadhana bhakti, everything is already included that we eat, we first of all, we cook it as an offering to Krishna, and we offer it as an offering, and we take that as a, as a sacrifice, we take the remnants of sacrifice. Just like the yogis who do fire sacrifice, and then they take the remnants of the fire sacrifice, similarly offering to the form of, the, of Krishna, deity form, foodstuff. And then taking the offering is described as a sacrifice. You take the remnants of sacrifice, it frees you from karma. And there's no, now not only is there no karma, but it frees you from existing karma. So the eating is a completely spiritual activity. Throughout the day, as the person is acting, they have the guidance of the spiritual master, how one, either married or unmarried, how they can act in such a way that they're not producing any karma, that their activities are always connected connected with the Lord in devotional service. So every activity becomes a meditation. Is he, is he doing this action, these offerings, that blindly? Blindly, meaning? Blindly, yeah. Is he performing these offerings? Like, so that, like so I, can't, I can't comprehend uh, you know, the meaning or experience of offering something to God, you know, because, like... You ever seen that temple? Yeah. You know the deities there? Yeah. So these deities are described in the uh, Vedas as incarnations, as five incarnations of God, five manifestations of God. His original form of the spiritual world, his expansion, his, uh, his uh, partial expansion, his incarnation, no, his expansion, then his incarnation, then his uh, empowered incarnation, where he puts his potency on some living entity, and his uh, deity form, called Archa Avatar. Archa means worshipable avatar, or incarnation. That because everything is ultimately, there's a universe, universe, unity and diversity, that everything is ultimately the energy of God. Nothing is separate from uh, the Absolute. So, the energies of material nature, if they're prepared according to certain Vedic uh, systems, and if they're established according to the rites of uh, Bhakti Yoga, then these deities are considered to be, the Lord is uh, drawn there by various mantras, and that He is present, and the devotees experience that God is actually present there in a deity form. It's not like an idol or something like that not just as a form of meditation, but actually it's an incarnation of God. And then for some deities, from some devotees who are very pure, they're able to also realize that that's God, and they're able to communicate directly, even by talking or through meditation with the deities. And the deity personally reciprocates. So these are something which ordinary people won't be able to understand. Maybe it's something which just has to be either left to the Vedas or left to faith. But the devotees actually experience that these are uh, that the Lord is present there. And even if you want to just take it abstractly, the prasadam or food is prepared as a meditation and offered up to Krishna, 
And so because everything is done with that attitude, then in any case all the energy is going to the Absolute. It's not being diverted to any other destination. But actually the devotees experience uh, directly that Krishna is present there in his deity form, just as they experience that he's present as the mantra. And the Absolute, the form of the deity, the mantra, meditation, they're all absolute. None of them are relative. So we have this installed deities which were installed by Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And these these deity forms are being worshipped. And all the uh, there's uh, some people are called pujaris. Their whole day is is uh, doing personal service for the deities. Which, if you ever interested, I can explain that also. I think I saw You usually don't. You just see a very small fraction of it. It's usually done behind. That's the public worship called arati, where you offer incense. But behind the curtains, there's many other secret rituals, <laughs> <laughs> which are not shown to the public, which are going on, which are very personal in nature, and which actually, of course, are very intimate real meditations. They're very intimate meditations, which one or two or three, depending how many are, what are there, a uh, person's actually doing this uh, very intimate meditation on the form of the Lord. And... Uh, there are many experiences. Sometimes if the person in the med- made a mistake in the meditation during the night, the, uh, the deity comes in a dream and uh, instructs that devotee in different ways. So many things like that. Uh, even in the conditional state as you're advancing, there are many experiences that a person may have. So it's not uh, just blindly. But we're following according to the, uh, just like Patanjali, his, 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 his teachings are there in books. So we're following the teachings of Narada Muni of the Asteva. This system has been handed down from Lord Brahma. In the Padma Purana it says that spiritual realization will be handed down as four sampradayas, four different disciplic successions, Brahma, Rudra, uh, Sri, and uh, Kumara. So we're coming in the Brahma sampradaya. Actually, Patanjali is not one of the four recognized sampradayas. His is an uh, offshoot. Technically speaking, although it's a recognized process of yoga, in one sense, I mean, everyone knows Patanjali's system of yoga, but actually for achieving the full God-realization, it's not one of the four authorized systems. For full God-realization, he's only teaching a partial God-realization. He's only teaching the realization of the light, which is which is better than nothing. But uh, one may fall down from that. Even when achieves that liberation, one may fall down again. So this way, as I mentioned, the whole day the activities are arranged in a completely spiritual way. Every activity is a form of meditation. So you're eating, the activities, everything is done as a meditation. Even even how to have child, child, even how to uh, procreate. Even even there's uh, forms of meditation and different way of dovetailing the activities so that there's no karma covering them. You see, but uh, so this path would be for someone, uh, the householder. Yes. Yeah. The regular job. Also. What about those activities then? Aren't they not as uh, no? So it, so. Uh, they're not because, see, they're not directly connected, but because it's considered that a person's occupation is, made, is, is a routine work, which is meant for maintaining the body. So a certain amount of energy always goes for maintaining the body. So the person for maintaining the body is already eating prasada, he's eating the spiritual remnants of sacrifice, he's chanting Hare Krishna, and the occupation that they're doing uh, actually, the devotees at work, just like in uh, New Orleans, is the person who's a full-time practicing bhakti yogi who has an outside job. And so it said, if one wants to be completely free from karma, then one should actually get 50% of whatever you earn for the purpose of propagating God consciousness, for worshiping deity, for some purely spiritual activity. And then 50% that you can use for your own maintenance or for keeping something for an emergency. 
And if you think that, then, it, then because you're a grihasta, you get this facility that 50%, then you're considered the same as if you to give 100%, because you're maintaining a separate situation. That's like a facility that's given. That same idea is there even in Christianity when they give 10%, usually. But this is uh, being completely free from karma. If you give 50%, then it's considered to be no karma. Or if, otherwise, that's why one needs the spiritual master. He will see each situation of each individual and accordingly will give some specific instruction. If a person, say, can't give 50% or some other situation is there, that's why the spiritual master, he takes the uh, responsibility of the karma for the disciple in the process of bhakti yoga. And according to his instruction, then the disciple acts, and the disciple is free from any responsibility for any activity done under the instruction of the Guru. Yeah. I can accept that, but to me it almost sounds like The point is that it seems like it's beyond reality, but really that's the unfathomableness of the laws of karma. Um, Just like, for instance, everything you do, it's not only the action, but it's the purpose that is inclu- that is understood in the karma. Just like a doctor is operating on people to give, take, to, to save their life. Even if a person dies on the operating table, he's not, as long as his intention was to save the person, he's not considered to be a murderer. Even in the law of the state, also in the law of karma. You see. But say a person is a, an armed robber and he comes in and he shoots someone trying to do the robbery and the person dies, then he's guilty of murder. So according to the law of karma, he's also responsible. So both people may have actually been the cause of a person's death, directly or indirectly. But one person is responsible karma-wise and legally while the other person isn't because their intention was different. So in the same way, a person who is serving to uh, to please Krishna, serving, not this is not a whimsical activity. These are all, in other words, it's not like we just make up, believe what, what Krishna wants. All these volumes of books we have are all describing hundreds and hundreds of situations where different realized, self-realized <coughs> souls who are, who are seeing God face to say how they acted in devotional service. And then there's a very explicit purport or descriptions of how to apply that in our life. Just like how this mystic yogi offended a devotee who was, what was the devotee doing? He was a king. A king means he's got to handle politics, he's got his family and kids, he's got uh, the whole court situation, finance, customs, everything. But he was a king. In the early morning he'd get up, he'd chant Hare Krishna, then he'd meditate, read his shastras. Then, uh, then later in the morning, he'd go to the temple. He'd do menial service, sweeping the temple. As a king, he'd go in his temple and he'd sweep the temple before God, that before the Absolute, I'm actually just a small energy. I'm subordinate, not that I'm independent. He'd, just, he'd establish his, his, uh, his relationship with the Absolute through a service attitude. Our tendency in the material world is trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's almost a competition with God. You see, so in the absolute world, we take our position as a subordinate position, and that actually liberates us. Because then we become subordinate to God, we become independent to everything else. By being dependent on God, by being dependent on Krishna, you're independent of the material world. In material life, being dependent is very bad. As soon as you depend on something, then that lets you down. So the yogis want to become independent by stopping thought, by meditation, by withdrawing. In that way, the the devotional yogi, they withdraw. In a different way, they withdraw by connecting their service through a humble service attitude to God. And to others, they, uh, they act accordingly to their social position. Maharaj Ambarish, he would do all these services for the whole day. Then he'd go and do his his uh, kingly business that he had to do. And his whole kingdom was also made, he was the emperor of the whole world at that time. And uh, everything was done in a very God-conscious way. 
he would see that uh, not only were the economic, he would see the economic and all the other aspects, but he'd also see that people were actually being uh, trained in God consciousness. He would give charity to uh, religious preachers to go out and keep uh, uplifting the humanity, the other people in his kingdom. And his, and his whole day would be from the beginning, and then in the end, he'd again go to the temple to worship, meditation, and take his rest at night. And because he was doing this, that's why the Dravasa Muni thought, well, he's a king, he's an ordinary householder, he's not a material, a spiritual person. Because he didn't, he didn't just, he just saw him as a king, he didn't realize that by doing, that because he had actually dedicated his whole kingdom, his whole life, in, in Bhakti Yoga to the service of Krishna, everything he was doing was with the intention, I want to do this for the pleasure of Krishna. If your intention is to please Krishna, then there's no karma for anything you're doing. If you, if you, if a, if a uh, policeman is uh, trying to carry out his duty and shoot somebody, ultimately it's not responsible. If he's trying to stop a robbery and somebody gets shot by accident and he was, you know, in good intention, they may take him to task or something, but ultimately, generally speaking, they're not going to be uh, prosecuted because uh, it was in good faith. It wasn't a, you know, a malicious thing. So in the same way, when you're acting in devotional service, you want to say something? I, I just wanted to ask you a question. I want to give an example probably just about the fans. Yes. How when, when you start to engage in devotional service, it's like pulling the plug out so, not, so the fan is not being fed any more electricity. So it's not continuing to go. But at the same time, it doesn't just stop. It slows down. Right. And he's using it to... Uh, uh, give an analogy of our karma. Like what you were just saying that, you know, that uh, we, because we're doing it for Krishna our karma stuff, we don't get a new karma, we don't accrue anything new, but that there's still some, from that example, some kind of, is it that we're getting some kind of, like, because of past habits, we, we fall into uh, past habits, or there's still some, like, my new karmic reactions that we still must experience. Even though they're, it's from the past, it's not that we're accruing anything new. Same question, what about past? In other words, like, I still have this body. Like, maybe I, you know, I, I had, uh, I had, uh, I was in a car accident and I, uh, you know, I broke my leg or something like that. But then I become a devotee. I still have to, so I'm still suffering from that karmic kind of reaction. Is that what that means? And in other words, I still have this material body. Whereas it all gets passed on to the guru, and then if so, if it all gets passed on to the guru, where does it go from there? Does it just rest on its head? So the guru is responsible for all the karma. Let me take it back first. So when a devotee is uh, agreeing to follow the spiritual master, and he takes the oath to follow these four principles, chant Hare Krishna every day, to follow the instructions of the spiritual master, and to follow the Vedas, as a mother, spiritual master, as a father. So, at that point, it's not, it's understood that the person is not 100% surrendered, you see. So maybe the person may have so many desires still there, but is agreed not to break these principles to chant, to follow the guidance of the Guru. So these desires that are still there, even at the time when one takes initiation, the spiritual master takes the responsibility for the karma. That means for getting rid of all the karma of the disciple. And if he doesn't, then he has to ultimately suffer. Either immediately or in the future. That's up to Krishna. How that happens. If the spiritual master is responsible, immediately... All the uh, the uh, karma, the, the the whole link with the wheel of karma is cut. So there's no more new karma being produced. As long as you're following the instructions of the spiritual master, you're not producing any more new karma. And the spiritual master, according to your surrender, is is According to as you surrender. The karma is being taken off. And if in the future, if you do any other 
break any principles, then the guru also has to accept the reaction to that. Because that's, that's the part where it's slowing down, in other words, you may fall into some past patterns or something. No, no, slowing down is like you're, you're, you're coming in, you're, you're, you're fully hooked on with karma wheel. Just take it like, have you ever seen one of these uh, generator wheels in our, in our farm in New Barsana? In, uh, whatever they call it, I forget, I think it's New Barsana. In uh, Spain, they have a generator, they have a, a, a river going down, they divert it and it turns a big flywheel. And that wheel goes around and turns a big turbine. So as the water is flowing down, it keeps on turning, right? Mm. So, but the water is always running off it. But then new water is coming on. So like that, every moment as we're enjoying and suffering in this world, we're using up karmas. Karmas are leaving us. I just stubbed my foot. I just one karma is gone. I just uh, enjoyed something. One one punya, one good karma is gone. Different karmas are always going off us, one after another. But every moment that we're eating, that we're talking, that we're doing other things. We're again bringing more karma. So What's happening is that this momentum doesn't slow down. The momentum is full. It's never, it's never ending. As you're enjoying one thing and as you're, as you're suffering or enjoying and getting rid of some karma, as you're again creating more new karma. See, so this, this momentum is, doesn't slow down, it's keeping on full. So then, you take the initiation from the spiritual master and surrender at that level of surrender. And then, it's like you're not adding any more water. Right? But it still has some spin on it. It still has some spin. And as much as you're able to surrender the spiritual master and follow his instruction, then more and more of the existing, existing momentum is cut off until it completely stops. Just like, we, we, it's not that, um, and one doesn't, one is not, one is also doesn't have to suffer that karma in the regular way. That Krishna takes personal responsibility for getting rid of the karma through the spiritual master. So that, say, a devotee, like Prabhupada one time, cut his finger. A little drop of blood came out. He said, I should have had my head cut off. For doing a previous, uh, you know, karma activity in my previous life. But instead, I just had token one drop of blood. Or I had to suffer, like, in my head. But I didn't say my previous life. I just had to suffer one drop like that. <coughs> As a token, sometimes you stub your foot. Maybe you should have lost your whole leg instead of just hit your foot. In this way, Krishna gives a token because in the path of self-realization, to suffer a little pain sometimes is needed just to give us the proper attitude. Just to give it one... Because we have desires in our in our in in a dormant form, still in our heart. So we have those desires there. So those des, when those desires are there also with them, there are certain karmas there. That's why the desire, it's all like, they're all linked together. You desire to enjoy one thing, that's a result of having sinful karma of a particular nature. So then, because the person is doing the devotional service, then you, you get a token reaction, which is enough to bring you back into focus and give up the, that particular desire at the same time. And in this way, as you're going on, the momentum is knocked down, down to one becomes completely desireless for any material desire, and becomes at that time completely sinless also. What happens if you then uh, pull, put the plug back in, and uh, you start up and is it that you, does it start off that you know, all those pages of common been destroyed, or that they've been maintained until you actually and you got no, whatever you wiped off is wiped off. Actually, you can't actually plug it in exactly again. The only way you can plug it in, you no longer plug it in. Even, even if a person falls down, it's not like they, they're responsible again for whatever they do. Not in the, just for that. But it's not exactly like uh, completely plugging in because still they're under Krishna's guidance. Even though they're responsible, but they get a immediate reaction. You do an ordinary karma, you may not get the reaction for ten births. Once you, you take the, uh, you decide that you want to become God conscious in this life and somehow due to some bad association, you fall down. 
and you do a karma, it doesn't mean you're going to get it in an ordinary way. You may get the reaction immediately to try to, rest, you know, to give another chance. You see that, and then the only way you can actually get completely back into the law of karma again is by offending the guru and completely severing that connection. Then you just cast back into the law of karma and then start all over again. That's why even if a person falls down from the path, it's not considered loss. In the next life again, they'll start up again, where they left off. They're not considered, their connection is still there, as long as they don't commit some you know, offense, they don't like, sever the connection through blasphemy and things like that, which are like direct uh, acts of violence. So is the guru just like on behalf of the disciples for Krishna and therefore Krishna is just sort of nullifying reactions to previous karma? Or is there some something that, you know, like the spiritual master, sometimes the verse of the spiritual master may have to suffer in dreams, or in some way he has to actually like get a certain punishment in a sense for... It's just like, it's just like, uh, <clears throat> uh, what do you call it, suspended sense? Yes. Yeah. You got to use sense of the material world. And it's like, you haven't served your whole time yet. Okay. But, and you, they put you on probation. That the state or some probation officer takes the responsibility on behalf of you that uh, he's going to be a good boy. And so they let you out of the prison house. But actually, you haven't served all your time yet. And if you run, jump, probation, or something like that, then whoever stood bail for you or whatever, they're, they're, they're held uh, at the task for that. Mm -hmm. It was on the basis of their recommendation that you were let off. So that way, this his, his question here, before you're self-realized, how can you, that even before you're self-realized, even before you're sent for self surrendered already you've been free from the laws of karma on the basis that the guru is vouching for you because you approach the guru and said, I'm going to follow your instruction. And so just to make the going all that much faster, one is free from karma on the basis that the spiritual master is accepting the responsibility for the karma. He's accepting the responsibility. He'll, he'll stand for that soul if the soul doesn't do it. Which is why if a person breaks away from the spiritual master, ultimately he's responsible to accept those karmas. So that's why he said he's a guru druhi, or killer of the guru. So actually it's a very big responsibility. How can he take that burden? What does he do with those karmas? Well, he does with what, what because he's also connected with uh, Krishna through the through his spiritual master. So, as long as he's not taking a disciple for any material reason, as long as he's not taking and as he's as long as he's following perfectly his spiritual master, there's just like a it's just like in a. Uh, in, uh, it, like if I turn this light on, now this light is a resistance, right? If you just put a wire between here and here, you get a short circuit because there's no resistance. So there's a certain resistance there, mm -hmm. which causes, uh, you know, which stops the, uh... Excuse me, sorry about No, don't speak. Okay. The point we're talking about is how the spiritual master can accept it. So that's the point, is that just like there's the resistance here, so that's creating some heat. Right? Heat and light are coming because of the resistance. It gets hot. Mm -hmm. When there's no resistance, then technically, you know, just like in a big wire, there's not much resistance, so it doesn't get hot. Ordinary wire is not hot. Right. But this gets hot because it's creating a resistance. So in the same way, if there's a, a clear medium, when you're perfectly following your spiritual master, he's following like that, there's a link. So those karmas ultimately transferred back to Krishna. But when a spiritual master, say, accepts a disciple who's not qualified, and he should have been more careful in accepting the disciple, or that the spiritual master accepts the disciple maybe because the disciple had a lot of money, wanted to get a disciple had a lot of money, but he wasn't actually qualified to be a disciple otherwise. But just get his money. Maybe he wanted to use the money for God consciousness, but still one's not supposed to do things like that. He's not supposed to accept disciples, even if they're going to give the money to Krishna. If a spiritual master fully used the money for Krishna, then you know, all these things are considered. But the more that one is slightly tinged with any type of material 
oversight or negligence or lack of following the instruction of the spiritual. There's like a slight resistance is formed, like a filter. So when the reactions are coming through from the disciple to Krishna, then a certain percentage has to be experienced by the guru. So for preaching, sometimes the spiritual master takes a risk and he accepts many disciples just to give them a chance and some of them fall away and as a result then he's held responsible. Even then the spiritual master may physically have to suffer or mentally have to suffer in different ways but if his intention was pure even though in the act of doing it he, he made some mistakes in terms of accepting unqualified disciples is a risk that you can take. Then still spiritually, spiritually the soul, the spiritual master is protected in terms of his, uh, doesn't lose his consciousness of Krishna. And if one's intention was not perfectly pure, then the danger is taking too many disciples can even pull down the spiritual master or can distort his vision, which has happened in some cases. So that's why we always uh, ask that people should chant Hare Krishna for at least six months follow the process of sadhana bhakti, they can test the guru, ask questions of him, and uh, practice the system, first of all themselves, be convinced that they want to do it for their whole life. If they want to wait two years, it's all right, five years. Some have waited even ten years before they took initiation, mm-hmm. practicing, before they were wanted to make that kind of a commitment. It's not like you first come and get your mantra and then start from there. Hare Krishna is given, first of all, one chance that even before taking initiation, then one gets initiated and then that chanting is uh, is uh, more specifically empowered. When you get that chanting from the spiritual master and he takes this responsibility, then one actually can advance much quicker. But even before then one is recommended to chant and to develop faith in the spiritual master. It seems like the key then the spiritual life and, and, and what you were just discussing, this whole process of liberation, you're kind of taking form as the relationship between the disciple and guru. That's the most significant thing, you know, that relationship, that devotion that the disciple has for the guru. That's what Srila Prabhupada one day told us in, in, in Mayapur. He was sitting there and he said that I'm not depending on my practice of bhakti yoga for my advancement. I'm not depending on my my sadhana, my practice, my chanting japa, my reading of the shastras, my writing, I'm not depending upon... He just started naming all the things that we do, that he's not depending on those. He said, I'm simply depending on the mercy of my spiritual master. But by the mercy of my spiritual master, I will achieve perfection. And I'm doing all these things to please him. This is a very esoteric, in the, generally in the neophyte stage, they're, they're considering the mechanical processes right now. But to actually have that type of faith in the guru is uh, tantamount having that much faith in Krishna. So that's actually the highest level. But for the beginning people, they're more attached to the ritualistic side of it. So they don't understand that this faith. But that type of faith uh, develops. And at that stage, there's such a... Uh, perfect flow of uh, of devotional energy that uh, the reciprocation is immediate. That Krishna and the previous spiritual master help. Without... Uh, and so that way one is guaranteed of achieving success of pure... pure uh, Krishna Prema, even in this life. But just even if you follow the basic system, you're guaranteed to get liberation at the end of the life. See, there's two basic systems. The ultimate thing is when you leave, how you leave your body. How you leave your body is going to dictate what you achieve in your next life. Very few yogis ever realize the truth in this body. It's possible, but it's very rare. It's possible in Bhakti Yoga to realize yourself even while you're in this body. But it's very rare. Generally, it happens just at the time of death. Just at the time of death? Yeah, death means you leave this body and you achieve spiritual realization at that moment. So the thing is that in the system of Patanjali or Eightfold Mystic Yoga system, you're supposed to 
I don't know what, I, I, I would assume Patanjali is synonymous with Eightfold Mystic, but I understood it slightly different than what's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. But very similar. You're supposed to take your, your, uh, soul, take the Atma to the light bears, and you take it down through the Kundalini chakra, then you take it up to this different chakras, and so finally it goes to the Sarvagya chakra, right between the eyebrows. The right, the right between here, just at this point, this chakra here. And then from here you focus, if you want then in the self same body you can go to any planet in the material universe. Or if you want at that moment to leave your body, then you take the soul which is being carried in the air and through this meditation, you take it out from here, the soft part on top of the head which is known as the Brahmarandra. And it comes out there, and then at that time the soul is liberated from the material Contamination, it can go right back to the kingdom of God, right back to the spiritual world, either to the Brahma Jyoti, Paramatma, or Bhagavan, depending on what level of realization that soul has. This is described in the fourth canto of Bhagavatam. Peter Maharaj was a bhakti yogi, but he also knew the mystic yoga practice. So when he wanted to die, he didn't want to wait till death came. He decided, I want to leave right now. He sat down and completely detached himself one after another from all the material attachments fixed himself in spiritual consciousness, lifted his body through the chakras, came out of his head, and then immediately he was given a spiritual form suitable for going back to Godhead, and he transferred himself up to the spiritual world. He was followed by his wife. So so the only difference between the Dabhakti yogi and the other yogi is that the other yogi can leave the body whenever they want to. But the Bhakti yogi doesn't uh, say the time when he wants to leave his body, unless he wants to use the mystic yoga system. Well, they can also use it. That's just a mechanical system to control the airs in the body. But they're already in samadhi, so if they want to leave this now, they'll use that system, leave their body, and they'll go back to Godhead. So whether one knows that system is not important, because we're practicing this meditation 24 hours a day. When it's time for us to die, to leave this body, then the other the other uh, facility which is given is that whatever you think of at the moment of leaving this body, or we're going to call it death, I mean there's no technical death in terms of what materialists know, the time of leaving this body, whatever you think of, yam yam vati smarang bhavet tajat ante kalevara, you want to read that? And just at that moment, whatever you're thinking of, that you will achieve. Just so, so because the whole lifetime you're thinking of Krishna through this devotional meditation, when the time comes when you leave your body, you also think of Krishna. Krishna also promises that that my devotee never perishes. So that one, by that moment, one is also able to think of Krishna. So then immediately you achieve the Krishna realization. Just at that moment, you get your spiritual body. But already you're developing it. In any case. So it's not a continuum of experience? In other words, you develop your experience in your lifetime in your body, and then when you get a continuum, or is it, is it a, a big jump having dropped the body and going to the spiritual world? Do you know what I mean? For some it was a big jump. For Ajahnil, his whole life he didn't do anything. At the last, in his childhood he practiced bhakti yoga, he fell down, was living with prostitutes. He became a thief and a drunkard. And at the last moment of his life, he, he, he chanted the name Narayana, remembered his childhood worship. And immediately, because he did that, he was immediately saved from uh, from uh, suffering the worst karmas. For him, it was like he didn't return. Uh, because he wasn't because he wasn't completely ready to go back to God, that he was given another. He was he was saved. He was returned back to his body. And but, be, he, but because he left his body, he was turned back to his body like a second chance. He was, he was he completely, because of that experience, lost all attachment for the prostitute and the house and everything. He just immediately went to Rishikesh and started worshipping in the temple of Vishnu there and completely finished off the last uh, sense of karmas that were left. Sometimes the karmas are gone, but it's just like the habit, the momentum is there, the habit, the tendencies to again... You see, actually the person surrenders fully at initiation and all the karmas also can be taken. It's not like that, but still the type of like residue, 
like sense, the type of uh, still a momentum, a habit of acting and doing in a certain way is there. And to get freed of that, then one also is, depend, each, each case is an individual. So this Ajumil then after a short time of being in this uh, ashram in Rishikesh, then again he uh, left his body and got a spiritual form. But his form had already become purified before he left. But at that, just those last year or whatever, few days, whatever time it was that he was there worshipping, then he completely prepared himself for actually leaving in the proper consciousness. But there's other circumstances also where a person just at the last moment said Krishna and then got back to it. Yeah. But generally that's, we don't want to depend on that. Usually at the last moment you won't think of Krishna. It was a great fortune that he did. But if you're always in the habit of thinking of Krishna, through this meditation, then at the last moment you also think of Krishna. Okay. And during and during the time, it's it's uh, for him it was a jump, but for the people who are practicing regularly, it's a gradual progression. And when they when they uh, leave their body, it describes it's like walking through a door. It's like walking out of the darkness into the light. In a dark room, you open the door and walk into the light. So that you already walk right up to the door, and before that you already know everything that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then immediately all the last shreds of uh, darkness are removed. But a person can also experience that even in this body. But then one has to be very uh, determined. It's like you can get promoted even when you're reading in the class. They can promote the upper grade right there. But generally speaking, you wait till the final exam, take it, and then you get your... You already know the things that you're taking. <coughs> so, in other words, all the devotees here are more or less preparing themselves for the moment of death of the body, for spiritual liberation, or... Well, they're all just trying to get the spirit. They're already considered liberated in one sense that they're already liberated from karma. But they're acting on a liberated platform. And which of the devotees are at which level of realization that only another self-realized soul can tell? You see, the conditioned soul, even himself, doesn't always know exactly what level he's at. For that, there are different symptoms given nectar of devotion. You can see what symptoms you are at. Also in the Chaitanya Charanamrita Madhya Lila, it gives the symptoms whereby one can understand what level of advancement he's at by seeing different symptoms or what level another person is at. There are some subtle and some external symptoms. The subtle symptoms are more important than the external symptoms because the external symptoms could be imitated, but the subtle symptoms are very hard to imitate. Bhavas and Anubhavas. Anyway, it's uh, 11 o'clock. <laughs> and I get these discussions, I don't remember what time it is. So, Ron? I very much enjoy your attention. Well, whether you're going to be coming back tomorrow again, you're staying over tonight? No, I'll be staying over, but I'd like to come back tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be having some ceremonies and again again in the evening probably another question after. Otherwise in the morning we have a class in all seven, right? We hope. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> be the results of my starting chanting but maintaining my practice I did. I have experienced a lot of growth and a lot of development in the practice that I have that I do. It's like saying it's like no no it's like my awareness and I realized it's like saying that what's the uh, what's wrong if I keep my automobile for driving to uh, to New York while I'm taking the jet to fly there. <laughs> when I keep the automobile, it doesn't, doesn't make any difference. When mm-hmm. well, I'm already I'm flying there by jet, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> I have to experience or understand the, well, 
my practice is all mental, very subtle, so your quiet. Chanting, I don't you're... understand how the chanting produces that same experience that I get mm-hmm. when the, the, the subtle activity of my mind is transcended and experienced bliss in that way. The vibration is actually a spiritual vibration. So you can chant it mentally, or softly, or loudly. The whole point is that when you're chanting, if your mind is filled with that vibration, filled with those thoughts, in other words, you're supposed to be thinking, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. In other you won't be, it's not like you're saying Hare Krishna, and you're thinking about uh, playing pool or something. That would be not the perfect meditation. Although this happens, no doubt, that while you're chanting, your mind will go here and there. So that's the advantage that when you're doing a purely mental meditation, when your mind goes off, then immediately, you know, your meditation is broke. While you're chanting it out loud, that even your mind goes off, that at least a part of the mind is hearing it. You know, the mind is like the, the, the vibration is there. So while the mind is going off, the continuing vibration brings the, helps you to bring back the mind again to the meditation. In fact, if you try chanting out loud, and when you try chanting mentally, you find that mentally is much more difficult. I have experimentations that it breaks, and it's off on thoughts for a time, but with, that happens a lot less. The same thing, that that's basically the same. The only thing is that the vibration itself has a purifying, has a purifying effect, and by saying it out loud, because while you're saying it out loud, other, say a fly flies by, or there's plants, or other human beings, or anything is in their vicinity, they're getting also, a uh, fly may be elevated to human birth just by hearing the vibration. It's a fly because it's got that kind of karma, it's just immediately uplifted in the next birth. So in this way, because you're doing it simultaneously, you're doing your own meditation, you're also helping other souls to advance spiritually. So therefore, in every meditation, there's certain offenses that we have, spiritual offenses, and this helps to overcome those offenses by chanting a little louder. The other thing is that doing a group meditation when many souls together cooperate and chant together like we all chant together, that also has a special effect of actually, because this is, this is a, more pleasing to Krishna. When different souls cooperate together in a joint meditation, he appreciates that more. He, it gives him more pleasure that people are working together to perform the meditation. And that way it also has a much more purifying effect. You can get in samadhi within a, a few moments in a group meditation by chanting like that, where it may take a long time or maybe not even possible at all to reach that intensity by just a silent meditation. And what actually happens, like when the devotees are chanting, they're actually feeling spiritual, just an unlimited amount of spiritual happiness. It's not like, it's not an artificial thing, but automatically they uh, feel different kinds of spiritual experiences, which is why they're told that not to feel inhibited, they can jump or they can dance. They feel so much energy that they feel like actually jumping and dancing. It's not uh, a mechanical thing that they're just doing it. It might be mechanical when, when they're one, two, one, two, just when they're just kind of rocking back and forth or something. But uh, in the beginning. But actually they, they're getting this spiritual energy and so that's what makes them uh, feel like dancing. And it's, uh, that dancing also is uh, very purifying to the body, to the senses, to the mind. And in this way, through an active meditation, it's active, but actually everything is being involved. And because at that time, you will find that you're not thinking of anything else. At that point, you're, 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 you're in an almost perfect samadhi, if not a perfect samadhi. You're not thinking of anything else. You're not thinking about, you know, whether you're in America or New York or mm-hmm. Calvary or wherever. You're, you're just, at that point, completely fixed. In, uh, in that meditation, especially when you're chanting before these deity poems, looking at the deity and the chanting and the looking at the deity, then at that point they're just uh, completely uh, fixed in different transcendental, uh, real transcendental meditations. They're in actual samadhi. And uh, what's amazing is like the, 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 the
activity, uh, the activity because the activity itself is an offering unto Krishna. It's not like an independent activity. It's not that they're just dancing. In other words, dancing just for yourself or something wouldn't be the same. The whole point is that this dancing before Krishna is mentioned. That the say one is dancing and clapping his hands uh, before Krishna and he starts laughing. Uh, in ecstasy, what are the symptoms you might actually laugh? This is not. A, this is like this a spontaneous, like bubbling, just like a waterfall coming out laughter from the soul. It says that just like uh, when you clap your hands and birds come out from the field, or you have a tree with birds and clap your hands, they all fly away. It's like that. So many simple reactions, they all fly away. It's like it was just like you're just released from so many uh, karmas, they just fly off. So this is actually, uh, the dance in front of the deity is considered one of the devotional services. It's, it's one of the forms of service. So, they're actually, uh, whether they're conscious of, they're, they're, they actually don't become conscious in a physical sense of their body. They, they actually experience a different type of consciousness. They, they, Versus is really hard, you won't exactly understand without uh, really experiencing it yourself. Just like it's hard to say what an apple... I've through devotion, but I've experienced awareness of... Well, if you've had even the slightest... If you've had even the slightest bit of... Uh, uh, spiritual experience that would help you to... Uh, get a handle on understanding it. But I've also performed, before I came to Bhakti Yoga, I performed other forms of meditation and and uh, had various experiences. But uh, the experience of Bhakti is so intense and different that it's, uh, it's not... I, I can believe that it's full of a lot more energy than what I've experienced, just, just the fact that it's setting up those currents of love, the current of emotion. Even in a material life, what is the strongest force? The practically emotion is a very strong force. But in this like system of Patanjali, emotion is actually, it's completely negated practically. I mean, emotion is not used at all in terms of the meditation. Rather, one is trying to almost stop the thought process by a meditation and stop activity. And then one is able to come into a pure, so it's actually a very kind of unnatural, it's an unnatural situation a little bit. It's a very, uh, well, I think that's the proper word, is to say that it's unnatural for us to uh, try to become inactive like that. And it takes a tremendous amount of concentration and we're able to do it. So because it takes such an effort and concentration, uh, conscious effort to actually become inactive in the mind and then or just fix on that meditation in a silent way like that, they become very proud that they're able to do it. And then when they see the devotees who seem to be, you know, see that they're externally acting and, or they're singing and dancing or they're doing some activities, they think that, well, these people, they're not making any conscious effort at all to uh, be in meditation. So then the uh, followers of Patanjali sometimes underestimate and think, well, they're not actually really in yoga. I mean, it's like, it seems to be a karma. So this is, this is the difference even in India, finally. A, a self-realized soul, this is mentioned in Gita, he knows that ultimately there's no difference between the path of mystic yoga and bhakti yoga, that both of them are spiritual paths. But the one path is very difficult because it's very unnatural and the other path is very natural. So it's very easy and very happy. Susukkam kortamabhyayam. It's very easily performed. And it's performed very happily. Could you look that up? Raja Guya Raja Vidya? How do you know all those verses that Sanskrit so you study that? It's just such an ecstatic book that uh easy to remember. I mean I'm ready to read it. The King of Knowledge, the King of Education. Marishi doesn't even teach the verses in verse 6. Marishi has a translation of the Gita. Up to the first 6. Up to the first 6, yeah. And he says because the verse, the chapters after that are not even applicable until you 
your self realized, you realize the self is something activity and cosmic consciousness, then devotion and awareness of Krishna is possible in the Then it's only on the you know, the self is possible in that God. That's why I asked about whether or not we act blindly, you know, before we self realize as far as, you know, performing action for a God that we have not yet seen or cannot yet realize. Yeah, the uh, the Bhagavatam describes that this system of uh, the mystic yoga process is basically for those that have less faith. If a person doesn't have faith in, uh, in the personality of Godhead, because in Bhakti Yoga, although many people they don't don't even address it as faith in a sense because they just start chanting and start practicing even without very much faith or understanding and in a sense this is what Prabhupada did when he came to the West he would present everything but he would just engage the people in the practice I'm going to tell you like a confidential thing I hope follow it and because the process itself is the real process therefore they would get the result whether they really had faith or not you see so uh once they got results, then they got faith mm-hmm. in a very natural way. But in the ordinary, in the ordinary way, like in India, say, or other places where people uh, already have formed many ideas about personality or impersonality or different, you know, because the the northern philosophy they've already maybe formed some opinion. There may be some people that are actually biased against personality of Godhead or against devotion or against, you know, they 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 just don't. They have more faith in their body, in their mind, in their intellect, and in, and the uh, for them, following a system like Patanjali's, where one is uh, sitting down and meditating and doing hatha yoga or different things like that, and then do, and, and uh, controlling in that way, is uh, it's like something that they can, that they feel that they're doing it, mm-hmm. and as the doer, they are acting, and so for a person with less faith. In the personality of God, it's easier. Just like there was a king called Vidarastra who was blind, he was always offending Krishna. And he could never perform bhakti yoga because he didn't have any faith in Krishna. So he performed the mystic yoga process and was able to achieve some, uh, transfer himself to the heavenly planet. Although, actually, if a person doesn't have faith, in other words, Maharishi, Prabhupada never really got into any heavy criticisms of Maharishi. He was actually very reserved, but he never also said anything about him. I don't appreciate criticisms anyway. I like, I can understand clear. No, but I was, I, I, no, I, but Prabhupada did criticize some people like, uh, you know, the, the fact that Sai Baba was claiming to be God in terms of an incarnation of Krishna. I mean, he criticized that. Only well, respected him as a yogi, but didn't like that his him or his followers were calling him to God. Maharishi doesn't claim those type of things, and uh, I always saw kind of a, a mutual respect. But of course, philosophically, we have you know different paths of promoting. And ever since I uh, heard from a number of people that Maharishi had actually, when they had a private, when they wanted to go beyond the first six, and they wanted to actually get into the, into bhakti yoga directly, and they said that we want to directly practice bhakti yoga, something like that. I don't know exactly what they asked, but then he told them, well, we go to bhakti yoga. I took, I don't know recently if he's done similar. He was a little upset because he lost all of his instructors in Australia, took initiation from one of my god brothers about two years ago, because they, had all got up to a certain point where they just weren't getting any further. They'd already levitated everything and then they were just kind of stuck. You just, you don't want it to get further. And then they would ask various questions and then he would laugh or something. But he wouldn't actually get, you know, he wouldn't really give them the next thing. And, uh, so they started practicing chanting Hare Krishna and they experienced a lot of success. So then they took initiation. So for a little while he was upset because of the Australian thing. But I never heard anything, they said anything about it subsequently. So anyway, this is the uh, translation of that verse. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. 
It is the purest knowledge and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and it, and it is joyfully performed. King of education. Oh. Because you are never envious of me, I shall impart to you this most secret wisdom, knowing which you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence. He's giving it introduction to what he's going to say. Then he said, Asatha dhana purusha dharma syasya parantapa aprapyama nivartante mityu sanchara bhartmani Those who are not faithful on the path of devotional service cannot attain me. O conquer of foes, but return to birth and death in this material world. By me in my unmanifested form this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. And yet everything that is created does not rest in me. Behold my mystic opulence. Although I am the maintainer of all living entities and although I am everywhere, still myself is the very source of creation. And he describes how everything is resting in him, how everything is being created, how he's, all this work cannot bind me. He creates everything, he annihilates, but this work cannot bind me. I am ever detached, seated. First of all, Krishna is establishing that he's above karma. Even though he's the creator of the universe, even though he's the, uh, the original source of everything, that he's not under karma. That's the first thing that the devotee, to practice bhakti yoga, first you have to understand that Krishna is not like an ordinary living entity. He's above karma. And when you understand that Krishna is under karma, that this material nature is working under my direction of Sandra Kunti and it is producing all moving and unmoving beings, by its rule, this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. But the material nature is going on in its own way on the will of Krishna. He's not directly uh, directly uh, managing every single thing, but just by his desire, the material nature is going on according to his desire. Just like the shadow moves with the hand. It moves... And he describes the fool's direct. He's not involved with his own uh, development. He's detached. Right. He's always detached. Although he sanctions everything that goes on, but he lets things go on in their own way by karma, unless he wants to as some special purpose. Then he. But he's not. In other words, he's not suffering the reactions. He's not directly attached to what's going on. When we do something, we create something, we are bound by the karmas of that. So first of all, Krishna is establishing who he is. Mm -hmm. Fools deride me when I descend in the human form. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. Because the whole point is that if you can understand that the personality of Godhead is above the material world completely, even Shankaracharya said, Narayana Paro Bhakta, Narayana is above the material nature above the unmanifested. Then, every action you do, which is authorized by Krishna and directed to Him, that action, the karma of that, is going to Krishna. It doesn't go to the... Just like if you tell me to go out and kill someone, then you're responsible also, even in the material law and karma. Mm -hmm. So if Krishna is saying, you do this, you do that, and we do that on His instruction, then we're not responsible for the karma. Mm -hmm. So to understand that, first you have to understand that Krishna is above karma. And then, so that's what he's establishing here first. For those who are bewildered and attracted by demonic, atheistic views, in other words, who don't have faith in the person I got in, and that deluded condition, their hopes for liberation, their fruit of activities, and their culture of knowledge are defeated. And now, here's the action. Now, all this, in other words, he said, I'm giving you the secret knowledge the king of education, which is joyfully performed. But up to now, he hasn't said to perform anything. Mm -hmm. He described himself, right. how he creates the material world, how he's above it, how he's detached, how, even though he does this, he's not bound by any of the work that he's doing. It's a very important point, because any yoga is to get out of karma. Then he comes into this, O Sana Prita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. 
they are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaustible. Always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination, bowing down before me, these great souls perpetually worship me with devotion.